Welcome to our Blank Slate webinar this morning, uh, which is titled Landlord and Tenant, the Repurposing of Empty Space. Our Blank Slate webinars, this is number two in a series of three short, practically focused webinars focusing on the issues surrounding empty or unwanted space. Number one last Wednesday was about lease exit strategies. Number three next Wednesday is about dilapidations, disrepair and alterations. And this is number two, and it's about the repurposing of empty space. Can we move the slide on, please. There will be a recording available afterwards and you'll all receive an email with a recording of this session in case there's anything that, uh, that you need to revisit. And also, please, as we're going along, we have got two speakers in today. Please feel free to drop a question into the Q&A box. We have had a few ones already sent through, but we'll do our best to try and answer them if you do put a question into the Q&A box. My name is Richard New and I head up the real estate disputes team here at Mills and Reeve. You'll be glad to hear that for today's session, I've been relegated merely to the role of host and I'm passing speaking duties on to two far more qualified and knowledgeable people in Caroline Bywater and Andrew Timoney. Caroline Bywater is a specialist planning lawyer and her work covers a wide range of planning related matters for landowners, developers and local authorities. She's going to talk this morning about some recent planning legislation changes which are designed to help you repurpose an empty property. Andrew is a senior associate in our real estate team. He advises investors and developers and is going to discuss high street and retail properties and run through some practical implications of changes of use. So without further ado, I'll pass you on to Caroline. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. So I am Caroline Bywater. I'm a principal associate within the planning team at Mills and Reeve. And as Richard says, I'm just going to spend a few minutes this morning highlighting a couple of ways in which the planning system can offer you some flexibility if you're faced with the risk of empty commercial properties. And I'll look at some recent changes in the law on that point. And just to go back to first principles for a moment, bear in mind that you need planning permission to carry out development. And development here means building works, another operational development, as well as material changes of use. And the planning system has for a long time categorised certain uses together in use classes set out within the use classes order. Some of those I'm sure you're more than familiar with. So we talk about A1 retail, B1 offices, for example. And they said that changing use within a use class does not amount to development. And the result of that is therefore that you don't need planning permission for those changes. And for the most part, for landowners, that saves time and money. And of course, the ability of the council to refuse your proposals or impose restrictive conditions. So whilst that is helpful, it can still be quite restrictive. And I think it's fair to say that the use classes order hasn't necessarily kept up pace with how buildings are now used. So with the growing problem, particularly of empty high streets in mind, the government has introduced with effect from the 1st of September, so they're already in effect, um, some fundamental changes to the use classes order, including the introduction of new classes E and F, as you can see on the slide here, um, what those changes have meant for a number of different uses. Now class E in particular is aimed at offering exactly the sort of flexibility which you might be looking for if you're looking at an empty commercial property. Class E is labelled as commercial business and service use class. And if we flip onto my next slide, um, you'll see that it brings together a large number of uses that until now have been split around other use classes. So for example, class together, we've now got such uses as shops, financial and professional services, so that's banks, estate agents, etc., cafes, restaurants, offices, health and medical centres, creches, gyms, um, amongst many others. So it's really quite a long list of potential uses for a typical town centre property. Uh, the new class E makes it clear that you can change the use of a whole building or any part of it to any other use within the class. 
So there's a huge amount of potential here to allow a number of different uses even within the same building. And in theory, it should allow landlords to respond much more quickly to market and community demands. I'll just bear in mind on this point that whilst the new use class was intended primarily to deal with high street and town centre issues, it actually applies much more widely than that, um, and in fact without limitation. So it will apply across the country and equally to retail parks, industrial estates, etc., as well as town centres. Also, whilst it might have been built as part of a pandemic response, it's actually a more permanent um, change. Certainly, we've got no indication at the moment that it's intended to be temporary only. It is also worth noting that at the same time as drawing all the uses I've just mentioned together within class E, some uses have actually been taken out of the use classes order. Uh, that's most notably cinemas, pubs and takeaways. And those uses are now what we call sui generis, um, which means they sit outside the use classes regime. Um, and therefore planning permission will be needed to change to or from those uses. Um, so just to be clear on that point, once the transitional uh, provisions and some temporary COVID specific rights come to an end next year, you won't be able to change a restaurant to a takeaway, for example, or indeed vice versa, without obtaining planning permission. And I think the purpose here was really to protect community assets such as cinemas and pubs and avoid an over provision of takeaways. I did mention a new class F as well. Um, to be more accurate, it's actually two further new use classes, F1 and F2. Class F1 is learning and non-residential institutions such as schools, universities, museums, libraries. Um, so that's really much of what was previously class D1, although with the notable change that medical centres and creches have moved over to E. And class F2 is community uses, uh, uh, smaller convenience stores, community halls, swimming pools, etc. And the same principle really applies here, um, in that you don't need planning permission to change from one F1 use to another F1 use, uh, and the same with F2, of course. So whilst these new use classes do offer a large degree of flexibility, just be aware that there might be conditions or obligations attached to existing planning permissions, which restrict your reliance on them. And also if you obtain a further planning permission in the future, um, a condition could be imposed at that stage. So every case does require careful um, consideration at the relevant time. So if you're not able to rely on the new flexible use class, or it's not appropriate to do that for a particular property, you might also want to consider whether there are any changes you can make in reliance on permitted development rights. So here we're talking about changes of use or works which do constitute development, but for which the government has essentially given deemed planning permission. There are a number of different permitted development rights available, um, depending mainly on the type of property you're concerned with and where it is. There are certain rights to change use from one use class to another. Um, from B2 industrial to a B1 office, for example. And it's worth noting that until July 2021, those rights will remain as they were pre 1st of September. And then we're expecting new permitted development rights to come in after July to reflect the use class changes I've just talked about. So that's, um, those transitional provisions are going to be important depending on what sort of timing you're looking at. There are also certain permitted development rights to carry out building works and change uses where the principle of the works is agreed, um, or the principle of the change is agreed, but where there's a need to go through a formal prior approval process. And that entails an application to the planning authority to agree certain details. And actually uh, for some of the more recent permitted development rights, that prior approval process is so thorough, you might think it not too far off a planning application, um, but I won't go into that here. Uh, most permitted development rights are subject to a number of different conditions and limitations and of course in some cases have been withdrawn entirely by local planning authorities through article 4 directions so again each case does require careful scrutiny. I've set out the most recent changes to permitted development rights on this slide and they came into effect in August this year 
uh, you'll see that there are new rights to build flats on top of existing residential or commercial buildings and in some cases demolish office buildings and replace them with blocks of flats or dwelling houses. I'm not going to go into any further detail on these um, new PD rights, if only because there seems to have been quite limited interest in them across the country so far and actually quite a high refusal rate for prior approval from local authorities. I think it's fair to say that one of the most talked about permitted development rights over the last few years is the right to change use from office to resi, which was introduced in 2013. Uh, that seems to have made the headlines uh, for all the wrong reasons. Uh, whilst it's worked well for some, of course, there have been some well-documented examples of some pretty substandard housing being provided in reliance on this PD right. Uh, the law has changed recently and is due to change again to try and address those problems. Back in August this year, the need to get prior approval to natural light levels in habitable rooms was introduced and come April next year, office to resi conversions will need to comply with national space standards, uh, just as a new build would. Before I hand over to Andrew, I should just mention that a campaign group has sought to challenge these new PD rights, so the one on the slide in front of you, not the Office to Resi I've just mentioned, um, as well as the new use classes in the High Court. Um, that challenge has been thrown out, but we are told to expect an appeal. So I think all I can say at this stage is watch this space and let's see what happens next. Um, hopefully everything I've just said won't become entirely obsolete anytime soon. And on that positive note, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to look at some more practical considerations to bear in mind when repurposing a property. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Um, as Caroline said, I'm going to focus on the, on the high street mainly, uh, and as Richard said as well, because these uh, on the high street seems to have been the area targeted uh, mostly by the introduction of the new Class E in the planning system. Uh, it, it's well documented that the high street is struggling nationwide, uh, retail property in particular. There barely seems to be a day go past without there being news of, of another casualty on the high street. So the introduction of the new Class E offers some new flexibility here. What's intended is that there will be a new organic change of use opportunity. So the intention is that the market will be able to dictate what uses are wanted or needed on each high street and local retail area. So thinking about shop fronts, what type of occupiers might like to have a high street presence or a presence in areas that have got a high street type footfall or connectivity? Of course, shops, but also solicitors, accountants, surveyors, safe agents, um, but Class E also includes creches, medical facilities, gyms and some local authority services. All of those types of occupiers might now look to the high street and think actually that would suit us quite well. So if you're going to be changing uh, the use of your building or you're going to be looking for a tenant that might be changing the use of your building, uh, there's a few practical things to consider. Um, the first that I've put here is utilities. <laughs> For example, if you've got a shop or an office uh, and you're now thinking actually you'd like to target a restaurant or a gym or something like that, you're going to need a vastly different type of utility supply. It's very possible that your office or your uh, shop won't have a sufficient water supply or drainage supply uh, to facilitate a, a restaurant or a gym or, or some of the other types of uses that you are now allowed. Um, it would be sensible to talk to your utilities providers early on to see if you can actually increase those supplies to, uh, to entice your new tenants. External equipment is important because uh, if you are sourcing a new tenant that might need to put equipment on the outside of your building, it's very possible that you might actually need a separate planning permission for that if you're altering the outside of the building. Um, and more to the point, does your building actually have space for external equipment? So, you know, not just air conditioning, but air removal. If you're having a kitchen coming in for a restaurant, they're going to need to make changes to the building so that they can um, extract air. 
Uh, and finally on this slide is fire safety. Uh, this will be a tenant's obligation invariably, but of course there's lots of buildings that are more amenable to fire safety regulations than others. So there are plenty of cases where a tenant would like to go into a certain building, but it's really a bit of a dog's dinner from a fire safety point of view and arguably not worth the hassle for um, those occupiers. So perhaps there are things that you could do to make the building more amenable to, for instance, a restaurant occupier um, and therefore make your building a bit more attractive to, to new sorts of occupiers. Um, moving on to my next slide, thanks, is, uh, is on leases. So the first point uh, only applies where you've got leasehold premises. Um, so you own your property uh, pursuant to a lease. Uh, and the first thing you need to think about is where are you going to need landlord's consent if, if you're making changes or allowing a tenant to change the use. So firstly, permitted use is of course of critical importance here. Um, it's likely and possible um, in many cases that a title lease um, will only allow a retail, for example, or, or even a more specific use. It's not uncommon that we see leases that uh, specify that the building can only be used for retail use um, and only for the sale of shoes, for instance. Now, whether or not that's the case depends on how long your lease was granted for um, and what your landlord's approach is, but it's worth checking it as early as possible. If the use class is limited in the lease, you'll need to have the lease varied. Likewise with structural alterations, it's very possible with these changes coming in that you're going to need to have structural changes made to, to your building. Um, and in most cases, or certainly in many cases, uh, if you've got a leasehold premises, you're going to need your landlord's consent to enable to do that. So we would recommend speaking to your landlord as early as possible because this is one of the, the points where third party involvement is required. With structural works, it's almost always the case that the landlord will want to have their own surveyors monitor the work that you're carrying out. Um, and that's going to have an impact on, on costs and, of course, on time scale. So we wouldn't want you to be in a position where you, you've got a great new tenant lined up and then actually you, you realise that it might take a few months to, to appease the landlord. Um, planning permission uh, is really a, a similar point. The likelihood is that uh, a landlord might be, uh, the consent of the landlord might be needed um, to a planning application. So again, let's cover that off nice and early because uh, you wouldn't want it to delay you further down the line. Uh, the main point I'm making on all of those is uh, get your leases reviewed early. Um, we, we would welcome um, the opportunity to review leases for any of our clients um, and point out what, what you might need to speak to the landlord about and, and, and where things can be improved. On the occupational lease, uh, this, this is something for further down the line. Once you've found a good tenant and, and you're getting ready to sign them up to the new terms, you need to think about the fact that if you previously had, for example, an office or a shop, um, and now you're granting a lease to a restaurant operator or, or a gym or something else. The, uh, the terms of the lease are quite different in, in some specific areas. So importantly on insurance requirements, for example, with a restaurant, insure, your insurers are going to have very different requirements if, if a restaurant is being run from the premises than they would have been uh, for an office or a shop. You need to make sure that the occupational lease includes the relevant provisions so that if the tenant isn't complying you can enforce it in the right way. Uh, on yielding up, uh, this relates back to what I said earlier about um, works being done to either entice a tenant in or works that a tenant will be doing when they uh, move into your property. Are those tenants going to be required to reinstate the works in order to get your property ready for their use? at the end of the term when they when the tenant leaves do you want them to leave the works in place will you be happy to um, reinstate the works that you carried out um, something to think about in the in the early stages when you're negotiating your lease um, on to my next slide which is my final slide and is what next um, so just a few comments on, on where we think things might go uh, re restaurants are, are an interesting point here um, and I'm querying whether or not we're going to see a bit of a move to dining in, given that in class E, you are allowed to operate a restaurant with a takeaway use, but takeaway can't be the main use. I think that's quite ambiguous. 
uh, not so long ago, uh, Domino's Pizza were offering to pay £10,000 to anyone who could find them a suitable takeaway premises. They found it that difficult to find good premises in the right areas. So perhaps not with Domino's, but certainly some historically heavy takeaway operators could move to include a little more dining in space in order to open up the high street for their use. If they could do that, then of course, how big does the dining element, the dining in element need to be? Um, I think it's probably open to abuse. I think that in the next year or two, we might see a little bit of case law to define what is and isn't okay on, on dining in and, and on takeaways. Speculative acquisitions. Um, <clears throat> we all remember the change, uh, as Caroline talked about, with office to resi um, conversion schemes. When that change came in in 2013, and latterly when it was made permanent in 2016, there was a very quick wave across the country of developers acquiring uh, office buildings that were either <clears throat> empty or unloved because there was a, a much different opportunity now to turn them into residential. I don't think we're going to see the, exactly the same level of interest uh, on the high street, but certainly there will be some uh, investors and developers who will see an opportunity now. Th there's a flexibility on the high street that hasn't been the case for the last few decades, and some developers will recognise the opportunity to buy up perhaps more than one property on a, on a high street uh, or on a tertiary retail area um, with the understanding that they will have more control over what that part of the high street looks like going forward. Um, and finally from me on uh, placemaking and whether or not this is an opportunity for local authorities. The first point to make on this is that actually local authorities have had power stripped away from them on this point because they can't refuse changes within use class E. As Previously, they, they did have power to, to say no to changes of use, uh, and so they've lost that ability. However, we all understand that most local authorities are a bit strapped for cash, and they, they arguably don't have money to go out spending on, um, on going on a, an acquisition spree. But if they did have money to, to acquire properties, then would this be a good opportunity? for them to acquire pieces of their own high street and take that control back. Again, within use class E, the local authorities, if they acquired pieces of the high street, would still be able to control how they expect the level of services and shops on each high street to look, what collection of services are going to be there. Um, arguably, high street premises are never going to be cheaper than they currently are now. So I query whether or not there will be many uh, local authorities um, seeing this as an opportunity to take back some control. And um, that's everything from me. Uh, thanks very much. Many thanks to Caroline and to Andrew for those talks. We've had several questions come in, so we'll skip straight to those. Uh, I think the first one's probably a better place for you, Caroline. Um, and it's a question that says, can I take advantage of the new flexibility in class E and the PD right together and change use of a shop to resi um okay so so i think we're talking here about changing a shop to an office within class e and then relying on the permitted development right to change the office to resi um, and if so unfortunately the answer to that is no currently at least um, the pd right says that the office has to have been in use as an office in um, I forget the exact date, it was May 2013, or earlier if it was vacant then. Um, so it won't work to do as suggested. Um, that was really, I think, to prevent new office blocks being built and then immediately converted to residential without having to provide affordable housing and comply with various other requirements that you'd expect from new build. Um, that isn't to say that things might not change in the future. As I said earlier, we're expecting new PD rights in July next year. Um, although for what it's worth, I don't know if we'll see it opened quite as much as that because that goes slightly against the grain of trying to protect high streets. Okay. The next one is for Andrew. Andrew, with leasehold property, what can you do if your landlord won't agree to a change of use? Um, unfortunately, this is likely to be a difficult point and it's going to come up quite a few times that I would have thought. If your landlord won't agree to a change of use and your lease is specific, 
um, and doesn't allow change of use, then unfortunately you're going to have to negotiate something with your landlord. Um, there are some changes uh, within a lease where you can argue that your landlord is being unreasonable, uh, for instance, on alterations um, or if you're looking for consent to assign your lease. The, the landlord has to act reasonably, but that law um, doesn't apply to changes of use. So in this case, I think the answer is um, be nice to your landlords in the first instance and, um, and see if you can encourage them to agree it. Uh, the next was probably, again, fitting back to Caroline. Do the new use classes allow you to make any structural alterations so that you can use your property for one of the other permitted uses? Um, in short, no, they relate simply to the use. Um, once you've made your change and you have a new lawful use, that new use might have permitted development rights attached to it. Although thinking about the uses we've discussed this morning, there's none that immediately spring to mind as particularly helpful. Um, but to affect the new use, you will need planning permission for any external alterations, so flus, etc., as Andrew discussed. Next one's for Andrew. Uh, quite a general question, a brilliant, on a practical basis. Andrew, do you think that developers are going to be more interested in the, in the redevelopment of local shopping centres going forward? Um, <clears throat> that is certainly an interesting point. I think that developers are definitely going to be seeing more value in retail property in town centres uh, than they have done perhaps the last couple of years. Whether or not that will stretch to shopping centres is hard to say. Shopping centres um, invariably come with um, lots of bells and whistles. Um, they're higher rents usually than just outside on the high street and in tertiary areas. Um, higher service charges and all the rest of it. But that said, the flexibility that's now been brought in um, does open up a raft of possibilities that, that haven't applied before. Um, looking to retail parks, for instance, um, certainly near me, I've seen a lot of supermarkets pop up on retail parks where previously they would have been, you know, B&Q or, or other types of uses like that. That's come out of the back of these changes. So developers will see opportunity to attract more tenants and they will be weighing up the costs of the changes they need to make and the market um how, how big the, is the market now it's certainly bigger than it was before these changes came in so i think the answer is um that yes developers will be more attracted to to these types of to retail premises uh, than they were before it's uh, just got 11 o'clock, but we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, and there's actually there's two linked ones to the High Court challenge that's recently been, been heard. I think probably the first part's for Caroline, and maybe the second part's for Andrew. Um, so Caroline, can, just, can you talk us through what the, um, the actual the High Court challenge to the PD rights use class changes was actually based on? And Andrew, can you give some uh, guidance as to how you'd suggest a user clause be drafted in a lease, given the prospect of a pending appeal? So Caroline, in terms of your, you know, what actually was the High Court challenge based on? Yeah, sure. So this was essentially based around the way in which those um, new use classes and PD rights came forward um, quite quickly, um, bearing in mind the fundamental changes they give effect to. And the grounds of claim were basically around the fact there was no environmental assessment taken place. Um, and it was claimed there was inadequate consultation and consideration of the effect of the changes on certain um, members of the, the public and certain groups. Um, I think I'm right in saying that all of those grounds of appeal were dismissed um, like I say, sorry, grounds of challenge were dismissed. Like I say, we are to expect an appeal. Um, I, I don't know whether it'll be on all of the grounds or just some of them. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and from my end, um, about whether, uh, how you should draft a user clause in a lease. Um, I assume we're thinking about leases being granted to occupiers here. The, the first point to make is that all leases should include a compliance with law provision. So uh, regardless of everything else that's stated in the lease, all tenants have to comply with the law as it stands from time to time. 
Um, so that's the first point. On the user clause itself, um, as we quite frequently see, um, going back to the old use classes order as it was, uh, the user clause might say uh, you are allowed to use the property for use class B1 uh, from time to time. So if B1 changed, then uh, then you would be able to change with it. Um, we would probably recommend something along those lines um, and referring back to the, the compliance with laws provision um, and as with all other pieces of the lease, we would strongly suggest that particularly whilst these changes are new and any issues haven't flushed through the, the legal system yet, it would be advisable to have everything done professionally. And just one final quick one for Caroline. Uh, aren't there already permitted development rights for retail? Uh, there are some. I'm not sure they go quite as far as um, allowing what was suggested earlier. They, they refer to um, resi above shops and uh, shop windows, etc. They're, they're quite limited, so they're not as far reaching as we might hope at the moment. Well, thank you both for, the, for answering. They are after the grilling as, as, as well. And uh, thank you all to all of our attendees for listening today. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and taken some bits and pieces away that you can help you out in your day-to-day -day jobs. Um, I said this is number two of number three of our Blank Slate webinars. Next Wednesday, we have uh, Henry Mahalski from our Property Disputes team and also Luke Molyneux from Hollis Global Building Surveyor. who are gonna be talking about disrepair dilapidations and alterations at the end of a lease so if you've liked this seminar please join us for next week as well but I think that's it from us so have a good day all